Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm going to be shooting another murder minute. So I'm going to open this up with a trigger warning. This video is going to contain graphic pictures, also graphic depictions of sexual assaults, rapes, and violations of minors. If any of these things are triggering to you, please click off this video and click onto some of my more milder content located in other areas of my videos. Correction, other areas of my channel. With all that said, stay tuned to find out who is being covered in today's Murder Minute. Hey guys and welcome back to my channel. So today I'm covering another Murder Minute and today we're going to be talking about Carla Homolka, I'm probably butchering that last name, and Paul Bernardo. This is going to be a killer couple um, out of Canada. Uh, this was a Murder Minute submission by Stephanie Lane. Now if you do not know what Murder Minute is, it is an app. I know that it's available on Android devices. Not sure about Apple. Check your app store, whatever it is called, on your device to see if it is available on your device. With all of that said, let's get into today's story. So, we're going to break down these two murderers individually and then get into the story behind them. So we're going to start off with Carla Hamboka. Again, probably butchering the last name. Uh, she grew up in St. Catharines, Ontario. She had two sisters and she worked part-time in a pet shop while she attended secondary school, which would be like high school, junior high type ages. Um, she was the eldest of the children. Um, and she was considered pretty smart and popular by most people that knew her. After graduation, she worked as a veterinary assistant. And this is Carla. Now, for our second murderer, we have Paul Bernardo. He grew up in Scarborough. His father was convicted of child molestation, and he also abused Paul's sister. When all of this information came out, Paul's mother became secluded and she even moved into the basement of the home. Paul was described as a happy and perfectly polite child he went to university and worked for Amway, which is an interesting little aside. Amway is a MLM or multi-level marketing, or also known as a legal pyramid scheme. In the 80s, they were sued, uh, but actually kind of weaseled their way out of that lawsuit. But Paul also has another name. He's also known as the Scarborough Rapist. And here is Paul. Now, jumping straight into who these people are. October 1987 is Carla was 17 years old and Paul was 23 and this is when they met each other during a time when Carla was attending a pet convention. On that very same day it was the first time that the couple ever had sex and this is a picture of them shortly after meeting. Okay, so now as a couple, they quickly realized that they both enjoyed S&M, sadist and masochist activities, and Paul was obviously the master, while Carla was the very willing slave. 
Carla became obsessed with fulfilling all of Paul's fantasies. Paul, before his relationship with Carla, had raped three women with an attempt on a fourth. He put these activities on hold after meeting Carla for a little while. That quickly ended in December of 1987. December 16th of 1987, Paul broke his abstinence by using a knife. He raped a 15-year-old girl. On December 23rd of 1987, Paul struck again, and this time he raped a 17-year-old girl. The very next day, December 24th, 1987, on Christmas Eve, Paul proposed to Carla, who obviously accepted. And here is a picture shortly after that proposal. Paul, as the Scott Burrell rapist, continued his rampage of young and underage girls for another two and a half years. Carla knew of his activities, supported, and even encouraged him as a loving fiancé. Paul was upset, though, that Carla was not a virgin when they had met. And Carla was desperate to make this up to Paul and to make him happy. She knew that Paul was attracted to her younger sister, Tammy. Now, Tammy was 15 years old, so Paul would peep into Tammy's windows. To aid in this, Carla broke Tammy's blinds. Paul would also sneak into Tammy's room after she went to sleep so that he could masturbate while she slept. Here is Tammy. Tammy was a virgin. Carla and Paul decided that Tammy would be the surrogate virgin for their relationship. This would also be Paul's Christmas gift. From Carla. So let's get into the Christmas from hell. Carla stole animal aesthetic halothane from her job. On December 23rd of 1988, at a Christmas party, Carla spiked Tammy's eggnog with the halothane. After the rest of the family had gone to bed, Carla and Paul took Tammy to the basement. Once there, the couple held a halothane-soaked rag over Tammy's mouth. Tammy was unconscious, and the couple started their sick games, and they videotaped it. At some point, Tammy began choking on vomit, and she died. Tammy's death was ruled an accident because the drugs went undetected in her system, but the concentrated halothane had burned the side of Tammy's cheek. Now, I'm going to go ahead and put a warning here. This next picture is quite graphic. This is going to be a picture of Tammy's face on the autopsy table. Shortly after this, the fireside chat occurred. Three weeks after Tammy's death, the couple made a video entitled, The Fireside Chat. In the video, Carla said that she enjoyed watching Paul rape Tammy. Carla also agreed to help him rape more women, even saying she would help him rape 50 more women if that's what it took to make him happy.
Carla offered to do it every weekend if that's what Paul wanted because you're the king and you deserve it. After all this, Carla and Paul go to their room. Scratch that. Carla had Paul go to their room. Now, they still lived with Carla's parents at this point. And Carla went to Tammy's room. And she dressed in Tammy's clothes. She returned to their room. And the couple engaged in sex while Carla pretended to be her dead sister, Tammy. At Tammy's funeral, Paul and Carla placed a picture in her casket with a note stating that they would miss her and they were sorry they couldn't protect her. Here is that picture. After the funeral, the couple moved out of Carla's family home and into a bungalow at Port Dolores, probably butchering that as well. But Paul blamed Carla for Tammy's death because it took away his sexual toy. Carla remembered she had a friend that she had met two years prior. We're going to call her Jane who was still a virgin. Carla thought it would be a fitting wedding gift to her fiance. So on June 7th of 1990, Carla brought Jane home where they plied her with alcohol and halothane. Once incapacitated, the couple undressed her and started videoing their sick games. They took turns vaginally and anally penetrating Jane. When Jane woke up the next morning, she was vomiting and nauseous, believing that she, it was all from the alcohol because she had never gotten drunk before. She did not know that she had been violated, and she even wrote an apology letter to the couple for getting drunk and throwing up everywhere. Over the next six months, Jane would even return to the home several more times. One of those times, Jane even stopped breathing in the middle of the couple's games to the point that Paul called 911, but called back saying that everything was okay, and paramedics never went to check it out. December of 1990, Paul started pressuring Jane to have sex, and Jane became angry and left. She never knew about the rape until later. July 15th, 1991, in Burlington, Paul was selling license plates when he saw Leslie Mahaffey. She was 14 years old. She was three weeks away from her 15th birthday. She had braces and was coming into a rebellious teenage streak. Here's Leslie. Leslie had started sneaking out of her home, running away, missing curfew and smoking. However, she would call her parents to let them know she was safe. Things changed drastically on June 15th of 1991. Leslie missed curfew after attending a friend's wake and her parents locked her out. Paul approached Leslie stating that he wanted to break into her neighbor's house to which Leslie just shrugged and asked if he had a cigarette. Paul said that he had one back in his car and so Leslie started following him. On the way back to the car, 
Paul wrapped Leslie's head in a sweatshirt and stuffed her into the car. Paul took Leslie back to the bungalow and introduced her to Carla. And in that introduction, he called her their new playmate. Carla and Paul sexually abused Leslie for hours and it was all on videotape. At one point, Paul said to Leslie, you're doing a good job, Leslie, a damn good job. The next two hours are going to determine what I do with you. Right now, you're scoring perfect. Leslie's torment went on for 24 hours. She was blindfolded the entire time up to the point, but the blindfold began to slip. And that meant she might be able to identify them. Even to this day, it's not 100% clear how Leslie was murdered. Paul says that Carla gave her a lethal dose of Halithol. Carla says that Paul strangled Leslie to death. Either way, Leslie was dead. The day after Leslie's death, the couple hid her body in the basement so that the couple could have a dinner party for Carla's parents. After Carla's parents left, the couple decided to dismember Leslie's body and encase the pieces in cement to dispose of the body. Paul, brought, Paul went and bought 12 bags of cement and kept the receipts. Paul used his grandfather's circular saw to dismember the body. Paul and Carla made several trips to Lake Gibson, dumping the cement blocks into the water. Now, two weeks after Leslie's death, would put you at June 29, 1991. And that is the day that Paul and Carla got married at the Niagara on the Lake Church. Paul was in charge of all the wedding plans, of course, because he's the master and Carla's the slave. He arranged for a horse-drawn carriage to take them from the church. And here is that lovely memory. But, June 29, 1991 was also a very memorable day for another reason. At Lake Gibson, a father and son came across cement blocks. Those cement blocks contained the remains of Leslie Mahaffey. She was identified by her braces. And here's those pictures. After the wedding, Paul and Carla were off to Hawaii to celebrate their marriage and a honeymoon. While in Hawaii, a woman was raped in the fashion of the Scottsboro rapist. Paul never admitted to that rape, but he did keep the clippings with all of his souvenirs, so it's very probable that he is responsible. There was an eight month break in their crimes where the couple could be tied to nothing. Then April 16th, 1992 rolls around. It's Good Friday, kids are at school, they're walking around, and Paul and Carla were driving through St. Catharines looking for a victim. They passed the Holy Cross Secondary School and noticed a 15-year-old by the name of Kristen French walking home. Here's Kristen.
The couple pulled over nearby and Carla got out with a map and called out to Kristen for help. As Kristen was looking at the map, Paul attacked from behind, forcing her into the front seat with a knife. The couple drove back to their home. Paul blindfolded Kristen while Kristen unplugged blindfolded Kristen while Carla unplugged the phone. The couple forced Kristen to drink large quantities of alcohol and submit to Paul's every whim. Paul forced Kristen to perform oral sex on him, saying, tell me you want me to be happy, so maybe you can go home later. Kristen said, I want you to be happy, but Paul shook his head like he didn't believe her. Paul forced Kristen to strip as she begged him to stop, but from behind the camera, Paul insisted. Kristen vomited so violently, the blindfold came off. Carla cleaned her up and noticed blood on her neck from an accidental cut from Paul's knife in the car. Carla cooked and served chicken for all of them that night. Oh. Such a nice, lovely gesture. Kristen talked about her boyfriend, Elton, and her dog, Sasha. Here's Kristen and Sasha. After this, there were no more blindfolds. Paul and Carla continued to video the rape and torture of Kristen throughout the evening and into the next day. Sometimes Kristen played along by saying the lines like saying Paul was the king. Other times she refused and the couple would beat her and degrade her by throwing her in the jacuzzi and urinating on her while she vomited and cried. On Saturday, Paul left the house to buy pizza. Carrie Patrick, who had caught Paul stalking her months ago, spotted him. She called police with his LPN, or license plate number, for you that don't know that, and description. However, the report was mishandled and never investigated, so no one came to the couple's home to investigate. That could have been what saved a person and ended a reign of torture. Paul returned at 6 p.m. and Carla and Kristen were watching the news. Kristen's father was on the news begging for her return and Kristen was crying and vomiting. Paul's answer was to put on Carla's favorite movie, Criminal Law. So here's a little bit about Kristen French. Her parents said that she was a very responsible young woman who came home on time, fed and played with her dog. When she did not arrive home on time, her parents knew there was an issue. Within 24 hours of Kristen's disappearance, the Niagara PD had a search team in the area of Kristen's disappearance. They interviewed several witnesses who witnessed the abduction and found one of Kristen's shoes in the parking lot. The suspect vehicle was described as a cream Camaro. However, Paul drove a gold Nissan in this picture. Two days after her abduction, which would put it at Easter, Kristen was suffocated. Paul and Carla had no intention of letting her go without a blindfold. Paul leaned into her ear asking, what do you know about death? To which Kristen said, some things are worth dying for. It took seven minutes for Paul to strangle Kristen to death. Paul said that Kristen strangled herself with a noose tied to a rope, tied to a hope chest while Carla beat her with a rubber mallet. Carla said that Paul strangled her with his bare hands. 
Either way, when Kristen was dead, Carla went upstairs and did her hair so that they could go to her parents' house for Easter dinner. April 30th, 1992, Kristen's naked body was found by police in a ditch 45 minutes from her home. A short drive from where Leslie's body was found, Kristen's body had been washed and her hair cut. May 12, 1992, police interviewed Paul from a tip but dismissed him as a suspect, even saying it was highly unlikely he was the suspect. The killings were dubbed the schoolgirl murders. Police believe the murders of Leslie and Kristen were connected, and in that aspect they were correct. Leslie's body was exhumed and blunt force injuries similar to Kristen's were found. During all this, Paul and Carla were in the process of legally changing their names to Teal, like the villain from Criminal Law. Ironically, they wanted to change their names to the same name as a serial killer. Hmm. Fitting. December 1992, police started analyzing the DNA Paul had voluntarily given three years earlier. Since it wasn't connected to any case, it was just there. It took longer for officers to get to to process. December 27th of 1992, Paul violently beat Carla with a flashlight. Some of the blows to her head were so bad that they blacked both of her eyes. And this is what Carla looked like after the beating. The beating was a result of an argument between Paul, where Paul confronted Carla over why she never seemed to be upset over Tammy's death. Paul even accused Carla of killing Tammy on purpose. Carla tried to cover for Paul, saying that the injuries were from a car wash, but she eventually admitted they were from Paul. Paul was released was arrested and released on his own recognizance, which means they thought, hey, if you've ever been in trouble, you'll come back, we don't have a problem. When Carla moved out of the house, never to return. Paul sent Carla a tape apologizing and threatening to kill himself if she did not return to him. He apologized for his behavior and begged for forgiveness. He said some things are worth dying for, for which that's exactly what Kristen had said to him as he killed her. In early February of 1993, DNA results tied Paul to the Scarborough rapist cases. Police immediately placed him under 24-hour surveillance. February 11th, 1993, Toronto Sexual Assault Squad interviewed Carla. Police told Carla they believed Paul had been the Scarborough rapist. Carla acted as if she did not know what they were talking about and only spoke of her abuse. However, later that night, Carla confessed to her aunt and uncle that Paul was a Scarborough rapist. She also admitted that as a couple, they were involved in the deaths of Leslie and Kristen. However, she never mentioned anything about all of the videotapes. Naira PD reopened Tammy's death with the new information they had on Paul. Two days later, Carla met with an attorney named George Walker. Walker contacted PD requesting full immunity for Carla in exchange for her cooperation against Paul. February 14th of 1993. Walker met with Crown Criminal Law Office Director Murray Siegel. In the meeting, the existence of the videos was brought to light. 
Director Siegel told Walker that due to Carla's participation, she was not eligible for full immunity. On February 17th of 1993, Paul was arrested again. Paul was not read his rights. Thus, the eight-hour interrogation that followed that arrest was not admissible in court. February 19th, a search warrant was executed. Now, this has to be the craziest search warrant I've ever heard of in my life. The scope was very limited. Only expected evidence could be taken. All videos had to be watched at the house. The house could not be disturbed. The walls could not be disturbed. The house could, the house had to remain relatively undisturbed. After 71 days, the only video that was found was of Carla performing oral sex on Jane. And this was the first time that Jane ever knew that she had been violated. The remaining videos remained undisturbed inside a ceiling light fixture. At this point, there was no evidence that Paul and Carla were responsible, for, were responsible for Tammy's death. Carla was offered a 10-year sentence for her testimony, and then she was put, she was put through a psychiatric assessment. At that time, she confessed to Tammy's death and a letter to her parents. May 5th, Carla received a new plea deal of a 12-year sentence in exchange for her testimony against Paul. They tacked on an additional two years for Tammy's death. I'm so glad that her killing her sister only granted an additional two years. May 6, Paul's attorney, Ken Murray, gained access to the couple's home and retrieved the tapes from the place Paul told him they would be. Paul had told Murray not to watch the tapes. May 14, Carla finalized her plea bargain. She told police that Paul boasted that he had raped 30 women and she called him the happy rapist. May 18th, Carla was arraigned on two counts of manslaughter. This is the same day that Murray broke his promise to Paul and watched the tapes. Murray found, Murray would talk about Carla's feral joy as she engaged in the rape and torture of Leslie and Kristen. However, Murray kept the tapes a secret because he wanted to use them to discredit Carla Paul's trial. Murray and the defense team were not very experienced in criminal law and did not realize that this action was withholding evidence. June 28th, Carla's trial began and Carla pled guilty to two counts of manslaughter and received a sentence of 12 years in jail. Her plea and statement of facts were not published under a, under a publication ban to give Paul a shot at a fair trial. Murray comes up with a plan to get, Paula, to get Paul a deal, and in a dramatic reveal, Murray wanted to put Carla on the stand during pre-trial using the tapes revealed reveal her true nature. The prosecution, of course, was not going to have this happen, and they kept Carla off the stand. They needed to make their, they needed her to make their case against Paul. And Carla had always positioned herself as another victim of Paul's psyche, of, of, of the English, Paul's psychotic behavior. In any event, the tapes remained a secret. By the summer of 1994, Murray is looking down the barrel of a huge legal and ethical issue by continuing to withhold these tapes. So he got an attorney of his own. At this point, 
Murray resigned as Paul's attorney. He handed the tapes over to the new defense counsel, which was John Rosen. After two weeks, the new counsel handed the tapes over to the court. The tape showed Carla as a willing accomplice, which created a storm, not only in the court, but in the public as well. However, the decision was made to honor the agreement of the plea deal that they had already made with Carla. So she had already made her plea deal, they had already accepted it, she had already been sentenced, so she was going to get to keep her 12-year sentence. June 19th of 1995, Carla took the stand. She rarely raised her voice or displayed any emotion while describing rapes murders and abuses. Carla continued her storyline of being an unwilling participant. She taught, she told it herself as one of the few living victims of Paul. However, the tapes depicted a different picture of Carla. By the end of the trial, Paul admitted to all the rapes he was accused of as well as the abductions of Leslie and Kristen. He also admitted to dismembering and concealing in concrete the remains of Leslie. However, he insisted he was not present for the deaths of Leslie or Kristen. Paul accused Carla of beating and poisoning Leslie and Kristen. Carla accused Paul of strangling them both. On September 1st, 1995, Paul was found guilty of the nine charges against him including the murders of Kristen and Leslie. No one was ever charged in Tammy's death. Now, Carla did get two years tacked on to her sentence for her sister's death, but that's as far as it actually ever went. September 15, 1995, Paul was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 25 years. Here's a sketch of him in the courtroom and him shortly after sentencing. On July 4th of 2005, Carla was released from prison under some caveats. She had to report to the police her address and who she was living with. She had to update that information if she moved. She was to tell the police if she changed her name and she was forbidden to be with people under the age of 16 years old. Now she got out on July 4th, but by November 30th of the same year, which was 2005, those restrictions were lifted by a Supreme Court ruling and probably one of the worst things to do. After that, Carla married her lawyer's brother at Barry Bordelais, and in 2007, Carla gave birth to a baby boy, and, and then she moved to Guadalupe and changed her name. Um, it was reported that she wanted a normal life, however, at one point, uh, it was reported that she was dating a porn star by the name of Luca, Luca Rocco Magnato. Um, now, here's something interesting. In 2012, Luca admitted to dismembering a Chinese university student named Jun Lin in Montreal. Luca also videoed his crimes. Sound familiar? Some say Luca and Carla never dated, and that Luca was just obsessed with her. 2014, at Luca's trial, is when everyone had discovered that Carla had moved back to Quebec. And here is a picture of Luca.
In 2017, Carla was volunteering at the Notre Dame de Grace, a private Christian elementary school in Canada, which should give you all the like warm and tingly inside. Uh, once the news was out, parents started to complain. However, the school took Carla's side and told those parents that they, not Carla, would not be allowed back next year. So, a known rapist, murderer, torturer, that person's allowed to be at school. But a parent, a concerned parent, who's worried about the welfare of their child, you're not allowed, allowed back next year. Get your priorities straight. Also in 2007, uh, 2017, that marked the 25-year mark for Paul. So Paul was eligible for parole in 2017. However, February of that of February of 2018, he was charged with possession of a weapon, a handmade shank in the prison. Um, he was scheduled for a hearing in October of 2018 for that charge, um, but he was also still kind of hoping for parole after that, uh, but it is known that the chances of Paul getting out are zero. And they even give a little bit more information on that. Um, they do what's called a psychopath evaluation. Paul scored a 35 out of 40 on his psychopath evaluation, and Carla scored a 5 out of 40 on the same evaluation. Now, Paul still denies killing anyone, but admits to all of the sexual assaults. He states that Carla is the killer, and he states that none of his rape victims died before Carla, which is probably true. But here's the thing, and this happens in a lot of team killers. A lot of team killers are people that are in relationships. You do have a few that are not, but a lot of team killers when you, they can be doing crimes separately that never get to the point of murder. But once you put those two together, it's like the perfect storm. And if you look at their scores on the psychopath test, he's at a 35, so he's up here, and Carla's at a five, so she's down here. The top score is a 40. So when you put them together, you have the perfect score. Together, they are the perfect psychopath. And that's exactly what you had. Like he was already doing enough with the raping and the stalking and the... He just needed that extra little push over the edge. And Carla was just that little extra push over the edge. Now, who actually killed the girls doesn't really matter because together they were doing horrible things anyway. In my opinion, they both should be in prison for the rest of their lives. They both should be locked away. But that's just my opinion. That's the end of this Murder Minute. Let me know in the comment section down below what are your thoughts on this case. I know it's horrible case. There's a lot of triggering information in this case, but let me know. What do you think about this case in the comment section down below? If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe. We'll ring that bell in the description box down below. You will find my Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and email. Facebook and Twitter mostly. My Facebook and Instagram mostly are just for you to be like, hey, got a new video up. Twitter's mostly where I go and I argue with people, so if you are interested in that, go follow me on there. Um, if you have any cases that you want me to research and do a video on, send me your ideas. I'm more than happy to look into them. Anyway guys, that's going to do it for today's video and I will see you on the next one. Bye for now.